Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Prospect Baptist Church. Hope that you're doing well today as we continue on our coronavirus-style gatherings. And uh, if you missed the update, we will begin to gather in person for our Sunday mornings on June the 7th. Um, but it's very important uh, that you do go to newprospect.net and RSVP. Uh, so that we know how many to expect so that we can plan accordingly. Again, there will be a process in place. Uh, if you haven't received that email or you want to visit and, and would like to know what that's going to look like, just let us know and we'll send you kind of uh, an update of what that looks like and all the precautions we have in place to keep everybody as safe as we can, but to still be able to gather together. So just two more of these. And then we can be back together. And, and as we said in the, in the update video, um, if you're not comfortable yet gathering together, we'll still uh, have live uh, services for you to be a part of. And so you can still gather together uh, with everybody, um, even from there at home, uh, until you feel uh, more comfortable and feel uh, like you're at a place where you can gather in Person. So, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Today we're wrapping up our journey through the series, The Forgotten God. Um, and I hope that it's been a time that's helped you refocus on who God really is, rather than the picture that our circumstances uh, often paint Him to be in our minds. We need to constantly and consistently take a step back to reevaluate our view of God. Because having an accurate view of God is of absolute, utter importance in the way that we live our lives. Now, our first journey that we looked at together was the forgotten love, where we discovered the reality that the love of God is beyond anything that we could ever comprehend or replicate on our own. Then we looked at the forgotten trust, where we saw that you and I can trust God when Everything around us circumstantially may tell us that we can't. And that if we're going to live the lives that God has called us to live, then it's going to take moments of really just closing our eyes and stepping out. But that if we're placing our trust in God, then that trust will never fail. And then last week we looked at the forgotten peace and how peace is found in God and in God alone. And apart from him, there is no peace. But too often in our lives, we try to find peace in anything but God. Then we blame God for the turmoil that we find within our lives. But if we seek God, then peace is ours in him and him alone. And so today we look at our last piece of this journey, of this series. And I want us to look at the forgotten joy. The forgotten joy. We live in a society that's governed by emotion. And everything is based on how we feel in a particular moment about a particular circumstance or about a particular thing. And this is why we are happy one day and miserable the next. Those are both emotions. Phrases like, just follow your heart, become popular phrases. And these things sound good, but the problem is that just because they sound good doesn't mean that it is good or true. So phrases like that of just follow your heart is saying just listen to the feelings within you and they will tell you what to do. But the problem is this, as scripture tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and it's desperately sick. And who can understand it? So let's break this down real quick. Our culture says to listen to your heart and your feelings and that will tell you what you need to do. But the Bible, as we've just seen, says that those feelings are deceitful and they're desperately sick and they're impossible to understand. So once again, our culture and the word of God are in complete contradiction to each other. And what we have to do is navigate this to see how we live in contradiction to the word, to the world within the world. 
That's always the tension that we have to walk with. But to be in the world, but not of the world. So how do we live in a world that's governed by emotion without giving in to the same mindset? Well, the answer is joy. Happiness is an emotion. It's fickle. It's on again and off again. But joy is a constant. Joy is not an emotion. Joy is a gift. And it is a gift that is found only in God and given only by God. And this is where many of us struggle. We base our lives on whether we feel happy or unhappy. But God never promises happiness as we define it. Because happiness is based in circumstances. And circumstances are often based on people. And people are flawed. And we constantly let others down. So if our lives are dependent on happiness, then they are dependent on flawed, broken people. Do you see the problem? If your quality of life depends on your happiness, then you have two problems. One is that your happiness is based on emotion, a feeling. And Jeremiah just told us that our feelings lie to us. The second problem is that you are allowing your quality of life to be based on people, flawed human beings such as yourself and myself. And so do you see why so many people are so miserable? It's because we're depending on something that we never meant we were never meant to depend on. Do you see why so many followers of Christ are miserable? Because they are depending on something that they were never designed to depend on. God offers us joy because he offers himself. And so today I want us to look at the forgotten joy. We've forgotten that our life depends on that. And the effects are real and lasting. So if you have your Bibles there in Luke chapter 15, down in verse 11, notice what it says. And he said, Jesus speaking, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. Verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The first thing I want you to understand on the journey of the forgotten joy is this. Is notice the ungratefulness. Notice the ungratefulness. In verses 11, 12, and 13, we learn that there is a father and he has two sons. The younger son comes to his father and he tells him that he wants his inheritance. Now, obviously, this is something he was to receive at the death of his father. In essence, what his, this younger son was telling his dad was, I wish you were dead. So the father agrees and he takes uh, the son and gives him his inheritance. And so the son leaves his father and his home 
and he squanders his entire inheritance on what the Bible tells us was reckless living. Now, this son was ungrateful. He was ungrateful for a father that cared for him deeply. He was ungrateful for a home that was safe and secure. He was ungrateful for the life that he had been given. And because of his ungratefulness, he lost everything. And so he finds himself in a far country, all alone, away from his family, with no worldly possessions at all. He's broke. He has nothing. Why? Because he was ungrateful. The quickest way for you and for me to lose our joy is to become ungrateful. When we begin to look all around and, th and see all that we don't like about our lives, and we inevitably will become ungrateful. But what we have to understand is that it's not so much to do with what we don't have as much as it's failing to acknowledge what we do have. At the end of the day, if you and I lose everything that we own and that we love in this world, but we have Christ, then we have infinitely more than we could ever imagine possible. If you have Christ, then on your worst day, you have a relationship with the God of the universe. What more could we possibly ever ask for? But when we forget that we have a relationship with the one true God, and when we forget all that we've received in him, then we will quickly become ungrateful. And when we become ungrateful, we will lose our joy. And then we will begin to be governed by our emotions and by our feelings. And that is a dangerous way to live. And it's often not long until we find ourselves just as this son here in a far country with nothing left. The second thing I want you to notice is this, is I want you to notice the consequences. Notice the consequences. So we've seen the ungratefulness of the son. Now we see the consequences of his choices. Look in verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So at this point right here, he's lost his entire inheritance, which is all that he has. Now remember, this whole thing was his idea. He wanted his inheritance. He wanted to go away and to live however he wanted. And it was all rooted in his ungratefulness. Well, it tells us that a severe famine ran across the country that he was in. And in verse 14, it tells us that he began to be in need. So this tells us that to this point, he had no real needs. All the way back to when he was with his father. But his ungratefulness has left him for the first time in need. So he gets this job feeding pigs. And in verse 16, it tells us that he was longing. He was longing to eat what the pigs ate, but that nobody would give him anything. He's at rock bottom. But again, it was all rooted in his original ungratefulness, which cost him his joy. And now he is begging to eat what the pigs eat. But at this point, he doesn't even have that. When you and I allow ourselves to become ungrateful for what we've received in Christ, then we are on the fast lane to rock bottom. Because it costs our joy. Remember, when you lose your joy, you're now governed by your emotions. And remember, your feelings and your emotions, they lie to you. And you follow them all the way down. And that is the consequence of losing our joy. But we have to understand there's hope. Just because you lose it. And just because you may find yourself in a far country, it doesn't mean that you have to stay there. The third thing I want you to notice this morning is the repentance. Notice the repentance. Look down in verse 17. 
It says, but when he came to himself, the son, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So in verse 17, it tells us that this son, he came to himself. In essence, he woke up. He realized exactly where he was and how crazy that it was that he was where he was in that moment. And so he says to himself, he said, listen, my father's servants, they have plenty of food. And he uses the word in verse 17 that he was perishing. So this was serious. He was going to starve to death if something didn't happen. He went from not having any needs to being in a place where he was going to starve to death if circumstances didn't change quickly. So he decides that he would get up and go home to his father. And he would tell his father that he doesn't deserve to be called his son because of all that he has done, but that he just wants to be one of his servants. Now, how is he able to do this? Because he remembered the goodness of his father. He remembered all that he had to be grateful for. And when he remembered all that he had to be grateful for, when he remembered what he had in the Father, he realized the mistakes that he had made. And this realization is what drove him to go back home to the place that he never should have left to begin with. When we lose our joy, the only way that we can ever get it back is to repent, to turn away from the decisions that we have made, to turn away from all that we left home for, and to simply remember all that we have in the Father, to remember all that we have to be grateful for in Christ. There is no restoration of joy without repentance, and there is no repentance until we remember what we have in the Father. The fourth thing I want you to notice this morning is the restoration. Notice the restoration. Look in verses 20 through 24. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. So the son, he heads home. And the father, it tells us, he sees him from a long way off. And he's filled with compassion for his son. Now that's key. It doesn't say he was just filled with love. He was filled with compassion. Now why would he see his son and have compassion? His son probably looked rough. He'd been on a tough journey. And he had to look rough based on his own poor decisions that were rooted in ungratefulness to his father. But the father doesn't sit back and wait on his son to get there. He runs. And in this culture, men did not run. It was considered undignified. But the father didn't care what he was supposed to do. According to the culture, all that he knew was that his son was home. And so when the father gets to his son, the son begins that speech that he's been preparing but his dad doesn't even respond to what his son is saying. Just notice that? He doesn't even respond to his son's speech. Instead, he immediately calls out to his servants to bring the best robe and to put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and to bring the fattened calf to kill it and for them to eat and to celebrate. All of these actions by the father were actions of restoring his son back into their family. Why would he do that? Well, in verse 24, it tells us that in the father's eyes, his own son was dead 
and is now alive again. And that he was lost, but now he's found. The father didn't lecture him about all his bad decisions. He restored him. Why would he restore him without lecturing him? Because the fact that the son came home told the father everything he needed to know. You see, the son had so disrespected his father that he could have been killed in this culture. The only way that this son would have come back was by realizing the great love that his father had for him, which restored his gratefulness for all that his father was. When we remember all that we have in God the Father, that we straggle home. And he runs to us and he restores our joy to us. But there's more. If you remember, there were two sons. We see another thing that robs us of our joy in this son as well. The fifth thing I want you to notice this morning is the selfishness. Notice the selfishness. Look down at verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your, father, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But the other brother was angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and entreated him. But the son answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this, this son of yours came home, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. So the older son, he's in the field, he's working. And he hears all the commotion back at the house. So he calls one of the servants over and he asks, what's going on? So the servant tells him his brothers come home and that the father is having a huge celebration in his honor. In verse 28, it tells us that this makes the older brother angry. And so his father comes out to him and the brother begins to complain. He tells the father about all how he served him for all these years and he's never disobeyed any commands, but that the father never even let him have a young goat to kill and to eat and celebrate with his friends. And in verse 30, he twists the knife a little bit and he refers to his brother as this son of yours. So he's rejecting his own brother. And he refers to all the bad that his younger brother has done. Remember, that's not something that the father did. The bottom line is this. The older brother was selfish. Here. He rejected and he disrespected his father just like his brother did. And if you want to lose your joy, then you live a selfish existence. This older son allowed the actions of others to steal his joy. We should have one hope that everyone is restored to God the Father. No matter the circumstances and no matter the choices, and if we ever allow ourselves to lose sight of that reality, then we become selfish. And when we become selfish, we will lose our joy. And the last thing I want you to notice this morning is notice the perspective. Notice the perspective. Look down at verse 31 and 32. And he said to him, the father to the son, Son, you are always with me, and all this mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. So here in these two verses, the father responds to his other son and reminds him of two things. One, that all that he has belongs to him. And secondly, that his brother was dead and is now alive and he was lost and now is found. What's he reminding his son of? He's reminding him of all that he has to be grateful for. You see, we have to trust the perspective of the father. He sees what we don't see. 
And that is why we can live with constant joy without being governed by the emotions of the day. But all of it depends on whether or not we will trust the Father. Oftentimes we see parables like this and we get it. But we aren't exactly sure what it means in in this day-to-day life that we live. I've run a few half marathons in my life. I don't enjoy them, but long story short, I run a handful of them. And I remember the first one I ran was the St. Jude Marathon in Memphis in December. And I determined, my very first one, I was going to run every single step. I have to be honest with you, I didn't really train for this. So the idea I was going to run every step was not a great goal in the grand scheme of things. But I decided I was going to do it. I run every step. So yeah, actually it was great. The weather was great. It was cool. It was a smooth run. Well, somewhere around mile nine, I'm really not sure what happened exactly, but my left knee kind of gave way. And when it did, I felt something tweak immediately this pain just began to radiate in that knee. At this moment, my mind, my body, and my will were all at war with each other. Do I keep running? Do I walk to see what it does? Do I just kind of bow out completely? And as I was working through my options, I just kept running. In this race, there would be people at every mile marker to cheer you on and offer water. And because this run was for St. Jude, many of the patients of St. Jude would be at many of these mile markers. And there'd also be family members of those that had loved ones that they had lost that were former patients of St. Jude. And they would be holding signs in memory of their loved ones. And so as I came to mile nine, I remember taking off my sunglasses and just kind of took in all of those that were cheering along the side of the road. And I began to kind of make eye contact with each one of those patients and family members as I ran by. And this is the thought that came to my mind. My pain, no matter what it was, was temporary. So I will run for those whose pain may not be temporary. So at that point, I was no longer running for myself. I was running for those that couldn't run. I was running for something that was bigger than me. And so here's what would happen. The pain would continue to be there. But at every mile, I would once again be reminded of why I was running. And it would sustain me for the next mile. So I kept running. But there was another thing that was happening within all of this. On the number that you wore for the race, it allowed people to track your progress. So my wife, Lindsay, was able to see where I was on the course. And I remember those last few miles that she was sending me messages telling me that I was getting close to just keep going. You see, she was at the finish line and she knew everything that was waiting for me there. So I kept running. And I remember the last mile, the streets were lined with people. And I felt this adrenaline just kind of take over. And I couldn't even feel the pain in that knee anymore. So I kept running. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to see something within this story. Hebrews chapter 12. Down in verse one notice what it says it says therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse three, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. Verse one, it tells us of these cloud of witnesses that we remember. 
those that went before us. And in my story, that was Lindsay, who was there before at the, at the, at the finish line waiting on me. And then verse 2, it speaks of Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, he endured the cross. We remember in him the joy of the salvation that is set before him. And we remember what's set before us, so I kept running. And in verse 3, it tells us not to grow weary or faint-hearted. We remember that Jesus just kept running. So what does this forgotten joy look like in our day-to-day life? We run for those that are lost, that don't even know Christ. We run for the honor of the Father. And we never run for ourselves. We run for the other saints that we are in relationship with to encourage them on their journey but not for ourselves. Because as we run for those that don't know Christ, and we run for the glory and the honor of the Father, and we run for the encouragement of of our brothers and sisters in Christ, within all that, we make much of the Father. You just keep running. And as the pain in life sets in, you remind yourself that any pain that you could endure in this life is strictly temporary. Any loss is temporary. And you look to those that have gone before you. And you look to Jesus who showed us how. And we just keep running because it's bigger than us. And that race is where our joy is found. There's a little more to the half marathon story. The last mile, I told you, I couldn't feel the pain in my knee anymore. And as I crossed the finish line for the first time in 13.2 miles, I stopped. And when I did, an excruciating pain just shot through that leg and that knee i wasn't even sure if i was going to be able to get to the car but the pain didn't matter you know why because i had crossed the finish line my race was over but here's the thing what i learned in that moment was this if i had stopped before the end of the race I probably would not have been able to finish the race. But because I kept moving, but because I was reminded of those at the end and all that waited for me at the end, and because I reminded, I was reminded constantly of those around me of which I was running for, I just kept running and I finished the race. And at that point, the pain didn't matter anymore. Father of Christ, you may be derailed and struggling because you've allowed maybe ungratefulness to forget all that you have in Christ from the Father. Or maybe you've allowed selfishness to set in because you look at others and you think they don't deserve this or they don't deserve that or they I should have this or I should have that because you've forgotten what you've received from the Father. And you get up each day and you try to run your race for self. Forgetting the Father that we run for to honor. Forgetting those that are lost that we need to run for that they may know Christ. And we forget our brothers and sisters that need us to continue to run as we encourage them on their journey the same. And we allow it to steal our joy. Oftentimes when we read the story that we call here the prodigal son, we focus on that son that went to the far country. But what we need to understand is the focus of this story is not the son. It's the father. It's the father. It's the, the unbelievable father of this story. And the picture that we have of our father, God the father, 
that we see here. And so if you find yourself where your joy has just been dissipating from your life, then it means it's time to turn and remember the gratefulness that, of all that you have in the Father because of Christ. And you need to wake up each day and, and remind yourself of all that you have in Him and all that you've received in Him. And you allow Him to become the focus of your life. And you allow Him to be the focus of what you do. And that will keep you from sliding into selfishness. And that will keep you from sliding into ungratefulness. And that will allow you to stay focused on the race that is before you to run it well. For the honor of the Father. For the building up of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And for the hope of those that don't know Christ. So if you've lost your joy, it's not because it was taken from you. It's because you gave it away. But as quickly as you gave it away, it can be received again. Why? Because of the Father. You turn back to Him and you remember all that He is. And that is the first step back to joy. And you take just a step each day toward Him, focused on Him. You may be watching today and you're just not so sure about all this and God and Jesus and the Bible and church. And believe me, I understand. But my encouragement to you is in this story is not just to hear a good story, but to focus on the father of the story. And understand that that father is calling you to himself. That, that he created you and that sin has separated you from him. Yet his desire is to restore that relationship with you. So much so that he sent his son, Jesus, to die for you that you might live and that your relationship with him would be restored. And you may say, oh, you don't know the things I've done. doesn't matter whether I know or not. He does. And he looks at you and he says, you were dead, but my desire is that you live. You were lost. But my desire is that you be found. And your place is with me. And it begins with the question of what must I do to be saved? What must I do to know this God of the universe that desires that relationship with me? That created me and designed me and calls me to himself? His name is Jesus. And it's believing all that he is. And so maybe you know somebody that's a part of this church. My encouragement to you is to reach out to them and say, hey, listen, I, I was watching today. I want to know more about who this God is. I want to know more about who this Jesus is and this God that desires to have a relationship with me and that made a way for me to be with him. And maybe you don't know anybody. You can reach out to us through um, the website, the Facebook page, the phone numbers on all that stuff. And you can reach right out to us and we would love to have that conversation with you. And to begin that journey with you is begin with that first step. What do I do? And there are those that God's placed in your life that will help you walk that journey. And we'd be honored to do so. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the picture of the Father that we have here that's so accurate and so unbelievably um, amazing. And God, allow us to rest in who you are. And, and be grateful for all that we have in you. And allow that to be the focus in, of, our, of our lives as we run the race that's set before us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet. Shall meet on that view.
wonderful show to our beautiful Father above. We will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow
Good morning, everybody. I'm Austin Black, and I want to thank you for being a part of today's uh, service and gathering in New Prospect Baptist Church. Um, what a gift it is that we're able to gather together, uh, even in times that are kind of uh, wonky. We're able to still gather together. So, church family, thank you for being a part today. Those of you that may uh, be visiting with us. Uh, today. Thank you so much for that. and Thank you so much for gathering around and being with us. That means the world to us uh, when people gather with us. And so thank you so much for, for taking part in today's service, even during these wonky kinds of times. And of course, there's not a whole lot of announcements right now because there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, we do gather every uh, Sunday morning at, at 1030 and then we're back together tonight. Uh, each Sunday night at, at 5 o'clock. And then on Wednesday nights, we'd love to have you gather with us at 7 p.m. where we just walk through some different Bible studies uh, together. And so uh, right here on the Facebook page, you're able to, to take part in those things. We want to invite you to, to be a part of that on Sunday morning, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights for those encouragements. We try to post things throughout the week to keep you encouraged. We know things are a little bit difficult uh, during this time for many of us. Uh, and another, one more thing we want to touch base on is just because maybe we're not gathering, but the church does still have needs. We want to have bills to pay, and uh, and we want unless you want, I don't want to be preaching with the lights off, right? And uh, we want to be able to meet the needs in the community. And so, uh, if you're able to give and you can continue to give, uh, New Prospect, we have a way to do that here. Um, the easiest way to do it is to text the word New Prospect, one word, New Prospect to the number seven seven nine seven seven. Again, just text the word New Prospect, one word, New Prospect to seven seven. 977 and that will help us to ensure that we can continue moving forward uh, and continue to to be there for uh, you during this time and to encourage you during this time and to us to continue to grow in our relationship with Christ during this time when things are a little bit wonky and so again thank you so much for being a part today thank you so much for being here today and we'll see you soon <music>